Hey, mis compas, please uh, let me know if you can hear me. If uh, you're um, hearing me well. Just trying to make sure everything sounds all right. Trying to make sure also you guys enjoy the um, the premiere of this week. I think it's a uh, it's a very you know like a, it's a, it's a side of the story we seldom listen to. You know we always go for the big heads, flashy people, flashy you know like uh, law enforcement, uh, the chapels and the Pablo Escobars. But um, I wanted to bring you guys you know like the real people who's moving all this shit down the street the people who's making it happen so uh, this guy was like super nervous but he was super kind to uh let me you know uh listen to his story and be uh open enough and transparent enough to show up to this interview full face full name so yeah uh, Miss Compa, so I'm just literally starting these uh, live premiere. First of all, I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear what are you guys doing. I'm uh, having a dos X, so cheers, salute, compas. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys enjoy the uh, premiere. Um, and let me tell you what I'm planning on doing on this live broadcast. What I um, what I want to do, guys, is. Um, the uh, DEA and the U.S. Department of Justice recently unsealed a new indictment against 28 members of the Sinaloa cartel, including Los Chapitos, including Ivan Archivaldo, Ovidio Guzman, and Jesus Alfredo, the three, probably the three more active sons of El Chapo, because we're missing one who is uh, being really out of the, out of the light. Um, probably not even working or kind of like quit the cartel, whatever, uh, Joaquin Guzman Lopez. So, so yeah, my guys, uh, that, so I wanna, what I want to go is, uh, what I want to do is to go through the uh, indictment, read from the indictment and comment. It's a long indictment. It's, uh, I think it's over 90 uh, pages, but it has a lot of details. It had details of how Los Chapitos were allegedly testing fentanyl on their enemies and on you know like active uh, I mean addict people in the streets they were also feeding their tigers with uh, human people basically rivals they uh, share a lot of new names a lot of new stuff so 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 let's uh, I'm gonna read some of your comments first and then I'll just jump right into the indictment guys um, can see in here. Thanks, uh, thanks, compa. Great white. Hello from New Zealand. Hello to New Zealand, man. Uh, it's great that you are watching from all the way in New Zealand. Uh, lavish Lexus puppy. What did I miss? Uh, haven't missed anything, uh, man. It's uh, I just started. GMC. Salud, compadre. Um, Andrea's love. Why are you drinking Dos Equis and not a Pacifico? I couldn't find a Pacifico. Um, I literally got these Dos Equis on my way back to Albuquerque. Don't drink and drive, guys. Bad, bad idea. But uh, I just had a couple, you know, on my on my way out to uh, way to back from Albuquerque. I had to debrief from that interview and to you know like think um, more clearly. And yeah, I mean it's uh, well four hours, so I had to have some something to do, you know. <laughs> Um, age uh, 86R, ¿cómo te aseguras que tus reportajes sean verdaderos? How do you make sure your sources are legit, man? Uh, dude, I mean, you can always be scammed, that's that's clear. Uh, but I, what I usually do is I try to bet my sources. You know, the way you bet your sources is you need to find three of their sources that kind of says or say this sort of like the same things your source is telling you. Now this guy in particular, Bry, my man who was just on the on the show tonight, uh, he, um, well, he's sharing part of his story, right? So he didn't need a lot of betting other than prices, probably locations, which I had betted before uh, when I first met and started talking about um, talking with Bry. So that's kind of like how I bet at um, Bry. Um, the Mexican law enforcement uh, who was uh, last week, I did very well good betting uh, on him uh, weeks before, uh, you know, bringing him on. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vortex, uh, you're the best, bro. Thanks a lot, uh, brother. H86R, uh, it must be dangerous. 
I mean, it's not really that dangerous if you just ask the right, the right questions, right? If you ask someone like, hey man, um, how much is, uh, you know, like a gram selling in Espanola? Uh, what kind of spots are, are people selling? Um, so, um, a source told me that he used to, you know, know, get pills from Walgreens or whatever in front of a Sonic. And then if that source says, yeah, 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 there used to be a Sonic back then and blah, 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 then you, you're betting him uh, right. So, so yeah. Um, th third Coast Hustler, I've got a real interview for you, bro. Hit me up, man. Hit me up on a, if you, you want to go to my uh, IG, I'm, uh, I'm Luis Chaparro or Luis Kuyaki in IG. Hit me up there. Send me a DM and, and let's, let's see. Um, Coyazo Bernie was waiting for your stream all day, brother. I really appreciate it, my man. Hi, dogs, dude. Um, cheers. Um, you can uh, seek a public record. Holla at me. Sure, man. Uh, yeah, hit me up, man, and let's 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 talk. Age uh, 86 R. Eso es uno de los más interesantes aspectos de tus reportajes, amigos. Andas entre todo y no la verdad, brother. Yes, honestly, that's what I'm trying to do right here, man. I mean, I'm not trying to chew information and then spit only what i want which is usually what a news outlet does um i work for several news outlets as you guys know including vice news uh business insider fox news um cbs cnn uh, amongst uh, al jazeera amongst uh many others the daily beast um, yeah so i work for uh, many different uh news outlets left and right whatever that means uh, but, um, but that's usually what you do as a, as a major outlet, right? You get information, you kind of like go through it and then you kind of like chop it off and then spit it out for people. What I'm trying to do with this channel is to bring you the real actor. Sometimes it's really hard because like my guy, uh, Bri, he was really nervous to speak on a microphone, but I managed to convince him that his voice was really important to find out what is happening currently with fentanyl. Um, also, these Mexican enforcement from last week, he wanted to, um, you know, like be all masked and, and that stuff. Many of you guys said it was Ed Calderon. Um, it's not. <laughs> it's, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to have Ed Calderon and have him, ma have him masked, right? Like, I would love to have Ed. Uh, we, we talk about it and he will show up just as Ed, not masked. So this is a totally different guy. Um, Vortex. You showed a mail that was sent to you from a cartel saying you need to stop with the videos about them. Did you get more threats? Uh, Bordex, yes, unfortunately I get a lot of threats, man. The, um, on my last uh, live from last week, I showed you my uh, latest, latest threat. I was in LA, someone managed to put these on uh, my left uh, pocket on my jacket. I found it um, right there, keeping it as a reminder that it is not easy to be doing what I do and um, pissing some people off. And I guess that's the right way to do things. Uh, and also that's why I usually pledge for your kind support compass on, on every single super thanks, super like, super chat, or buy me a beer. You know, that kind of stuff really supports what I'm doing. Um, I'm doing it because I really want to, because I really believe in, in handing over information and I, I'm really uh, fed up of reading and watching a lot of misinterpretations, a lot of fake news, a lot of bullshit, a lot of agendas, you know, uh, and I'm doing it with all my love and, and all my best interest in having a lot of people informed, at least on the part that I feel that I can bring something new and something enlightening. Um, but uh, a support, you know, like five bucks, two bucks, one buck, 20 bucks, 50, 100, I was always helps out, man, because, uh, yes, all this driving, gas is not, it's not uh, cheap anymore, so yeah, man. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Manuel Beltran, do you think Ovidio si puede escapar de la cárcel? Do um, you think uh, Ovidio uh, will be able to get out of jail? I don't think so, man. Let's see what happens in the next administration. We're gonna have elections in Mexico soon enough. So let's find out what's uh, what's gonna what's gonna happen with the video. I think during this administration, um, he's definitely gonna have to stay behind bars. Mm. Mike John Henry was anything on the bullet? Nothing, brother. Nothing. I really examined the the bullet. I actually um, brought a U.S. federal law enforcement to help me, you know, track something. 
uh, I'm still waiting for for uh, for his uh, input. But uh, apparently, it was nothing on the bullet. Just a bullet. What he told me is that this is Mexican law enforcement. He uh, he told me this is absolutely Mexican law enforcement. It's a uh, I don't know if you can see it because it's probably too close and it might be blurry. Anyways, this is, a, this is what our Mexican enforcement uh, uses. So let's see. Let's see. Um, so, guys, if you don't mind, let's, uh, let's jump in into the, uh, right into the indictment, guys. Um, there's a lot of new stuff, a lot of details. That I'm going to try to go, uh, you know, like slowly through it and try to be reading your comments as well at the same time so let's uh let's see miss compass let me know if you guys can watch the page that i'm showing so let's uh let's see miss right compass now. let me know if you're if you're watching these let me you know guys i'm gonna switch again to to can watch the my camera just to know that you actually watch that um apparently it is showing so let's go and watch um apparently it Disney. is showing so, so this was a sealed indictment and from the um u.s uh, government watch. filed on um, the southern district of new york the same is showing new district so, so this was a sealed indictment first indicted uh, from the um, it is US, against uh, government Ivan Archibaldo Guzman Salazar the southern Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar showing the two of the so this was a sealed indictment first indicted from the Oscar Noel against Ivan Archibaldo Guzman Salazar the southern Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar showing the two of the so this was a sealed indictment first indicted from the Oscar Noel against Ivan Archibaldo Guzman Salazar this day sending and shipping fentanyl precursors and already made fentanyl powder to Sinaloa and a lot of other cartels they they both cartels Sinaloa cartel and Carter Jalisco Nueva Generación have the same suppliers they've been sharing um, you know sources for a while and this is one of the first times that we we can really hear the names of those um, of those Chinese connections. All right. Uh, I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back to the. Um, 
what? The echo is really bad. Echo, there's two is talking. Echo and compa. Oh, shit. All right, one sec, guys. Let me try to fix that stuff. Let me know if you can still hear me echoing or something. One sec, one sec. All right. A bit, uh, someone is messing with you. You're repeating like a mirror. Okay, let me know if uh, if uh, if you can hear me better now. Shit, I don't know what's happening. I I just have one audio source. Solo cuando te pones a leer los chapitos. So it's only when I. Only when I'm, dude. That's fucking crazy. All right, let me let me see what's up here, guys. All right, I'm gonna gonna sh share screen again and see if this happens again. All right, is All it right. better? I'm gonna. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm share I'm screen showing again the and showing the same page again. Let happens. me know, guys, if right. the audio is fixed. Is All it right. better? I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I mean, gonna I'm, I'm, share I'm screen showing again. the. Hopefully, it's fixed. Hmm. All right. So apparently, apparently it's, it's fixed. Oh shit! So echo again. It's when I switch. Uh, it's doing it. It's real. Yeah, that's crazy, guys. Because I don't have any other audio source here. Probably. A ver, a ver, a ver. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. All right. Let me let me go back at it. Sorry about these guys. I mean, I don't know really what's happening. But um, let me see what's up. All right. All right. Should be. I mean, I don't know really this should, what's happening. This should be fixed. I mean, but um, let me see what's up. All right. All right. Should be. I mean, I don't know really this should, what's happening. This should be fixed. I mean, but um, let me see what's up. All right. All right. This should be working now. I should only have one audio working now, hopefully. Is this working? Please, please fucking work. Let's see. Hmm. Fucking shit. Ed Carl is jamming you. <laughs> I don't know if I'm actually jammed, guys. I mean, not sure. Working. Seems to be working now. Clear. Okay. There you go. Fuck. Yes. All right. Here we go. All right. Here we fucking go. Finally. All right. 
Okay, so uh, this is uh, this is introduction. This is uh, the first pages of this document. Most of these uh, most of these uh, introduction is just a lot of uh, a lot of background, you know, on on the charges. And one of the most important things about this introduction is stuff that we know, you know, like about what is a uh, fentanyl, what is the Sinaloa cartel, who is leading that, uh, you know, that uh, faction of the Sinaloa cartel. Most of this shit is shit we know. Uh, probably the most important part is that uh, they describe the defendants individually uh, on this part right here. They describe Ovidio Guzman Lopez, known as El Raton, has been charged on a separate indictment, probably because he's going to face extradition. That's probably what this page is saying. Ivan Archivaldo Salazar, uh, one of the Chapitos and oldest son of El Chapo, which is actually not accurate. The oldest son of El Chapo is Joaquin, but he's not indicted. He uh, is not on this document somehow. Um, in that role, he commands the sicarios to penetrate violence to protect and further the Chapitos, op Chapitos operations and vast holdings. As detailed below, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar has ordered and personally perpetrated violence, including the kidnapping and murder of law enforcement officers and rival gang leaders. Stuff that, for the most part, we, we know, right, guys? Uh, this, is, this is all uh, background. This is all. This is all background on, on on these guys, but guys. But I think it's still cool to go through them to see how the U.S. authorities are, you know, um, kind of like watching these developments. Um, again, I don't know why Joaquin is not on this indictment. He, I mean, the DA is still offering over. I think it's uh, five million U.S. dollars for him. He's still on the most wanted list, but he's nowhere to be found on these indictments uh sources sources not in mexico sources in mexico say they're he's still in but sources in the u.s law enforcement sources in the u.s are telling me that um joaquin might be out of the game that apparently he they have information that he retired or he's trying to find something else to do so let's see I mean, I'm not sure if that's actually the case, guys, right? Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar, Alfredo, the defendant and other of the Chapitos, shares responsibility for the security of the Chapitos operations with Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar, the defendant, and is a major trafficker of fentanyl and fentanyl precursor. As detailed below, for example, Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar has shipped fentanyl precursors and finished fentanyl from China through the commercial airport in Mexico City. This is important. Both governments are saying that neither the U.S. or, um, I mean, neither Mexico or the U.S. Uh, or China, um, those two governments, Oh shit! Now we don't have audio. Is is that is that real? Like, no audio. Again. Fuck my life. Oh yeah. So more, all the people have audio, right? Like, so probably just uh, lavish. You 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 had a you had a quite show. My fucking god. Thanks. All right. So yeah. Um, I'm not sure why um, both governments are saying, China and Mexico, are saying that they're not producing or shipping neither already produced fentanyl or precursors to produce. But in this indictment, you can see that at least what they say is Mexico is, and one of those responsible is Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar. Oscar Noé Medina Gonzalez, a major player, Panu. He has a lot of narco corridos out there. Um, he's really known to be Ivan Archivaldo's uh, right hand. Day-to-day -day commander of the Chapito security apparatus, Medina Gonzalez oversees each of the Chapito's regional commanders 
who are responsible for security in their designated areas of Mexico, and the Chapitos gunmen, the sicarios, who are dispatched where needed to protect the Chapitos fentanyl trafficking operations, assassinate rival cartel members, demolish unsupportive businesses, which is, this is fucking interesting, capture contested territory, intimidate civilians, and attack law enforcement in furtherance of the cartel's fentanyl trafficking. Next one up is Nestor Isidro Perez Salas, known as El Nini, also major player, has a lot of narco corridos, and Mexican authorities very recently tried to capture him in Culiacán. Um, if you go to my uh, previous videos uh, when I was still doing the briefs, you'll find some photos of El Nini, uh, his uh, urus, and the operations to try to capture him. He basically escaped by disguising as a regular puntero in a motorcycle and got out. So the Mexican army arrested another man who was not a nini. Jorge Figueroa, Jorge Humberto Figueroa Benitez, known as the 27, are leaders in the Chapito security apparatus. Perez Salas works directly for Oscar Noé Medina Gonzalez, known as Panu and holds responsibility within the Chapito security apparatus for the security of the Mexican state of Sinaloa. Figueroa Benitez oversees Perez Salas personal security and coordinates Perez Salas fentanyl manufacturing and trafficking activities. Perez Salas and Figueroa Benitez are both leaders and commanders of the Ninis, a particularly violent group of security personnel for the Chapitos. This is also very interesting stuff because um, We've heard a lot, a lot about the El Nini, about El Panu, if who is who. So apparently El Nini works for or under El Panu. Both of them manage uh, the Ninis, the sicarios that um, are basically in charge of the Chapitos security apparatus. But at the same time, they have their own fentanyl operations, which uh, is probably one of the few first time that I that I've heard that these guys have their own labs and their own uh, operation of trafficking producing and trafficking fentanyl to the US um, so uh, and this is this is why I said that this is probably the end of Los Chapitos because they're charging everyone to Ivan Archivaldo to El Nini and his sicarios as responsible for trafficking fentanyl into the U.S. Let's uh, let's keep on going. Also, guys, remember that uh, for those of you that are um, channel members, I'm going to leave this document out there um, so you can read it and consult it and probably take notes and that shit. Livorio Nunez Aguirre, known as Karateka, Noel Perez López, known as Tío, Samuel León Alvarado, Luis Javier Benítez Espinosa, known as El 14, and Alan Gabriel Núñez Herrera, are fentanyl traffickers for the cartel engaged in the movement of vast quantities of fentanyl from Mexico into the U.S. in peel and powder form. One of the few, one of the last times that I was in Culiacán, uh, and when they allowed me to go into one of these fentanyl um, manufacturing places, at least one of those places was um, belonged to one of these guys. He, one of these guys was uh, the one who gave the order to allot me in. Juan Pablo Lozano, known as Camarón, the defendant, is a weapons supplier and fentanyl trafficker for the cartel responsible for distributing fentanyl in the southern United States and from bringing bulk quantities of pistols, automatic rifles, and explosive devices into Mexico from the US, which are used by the Chapitos and their Confederates to perpetrate violence across Mexico. So Lozano, he, uh, he, for what I understand, he operates a lot around the Texas area, including El Paso uh, and across the border in Ciudad Juarez. I hear that he doesn't only um, pledges to Los Chapitos, but he also independently sells uh, arms to different factions of the same Sinaloa cartel, but also of other cartels um, in uh, the south, the, the, well, the Mexican side 
of the border with Texas, like, like Nuevo Laredo and all those areas. Carlos Limón, Jesús Tirado Andrade, Carlos Omar Félix Gutiérrez, and Silvano Francisco Mariano, known as Rayo, um, operate clandestine uh, fentanyl laboratories for the cartel in and around Sinaloa, where fentanyl precursors chemicals imported from China are processed into fully formed fentanyl for subsequent importation into the U.S. Here is another thing interesting that I'm hearing, guys, from, from, from Sinaloa. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, a lot of these fentanyl laboratories that are set to be operated by these guys for los chapitos are actually operated for or on behalf of Mayo Zambada. I think there is an interesting um, strategy to blame everything on Ovidio and los chapitos to go against them. Uh, and I think El Mayo is playing this game very well, delivering or turning himself, you know, like his players and his laboratories and information to the federal authorities to, of course, have benefits, right? Um, again, this is what I'm hearing from people down in the ground in this area, from to the towns around Culiacán, where these fentanyl kitchens are settled or were settled at some point. Can't confirm exactly if that is true, but that's what I'm hearing. Let's go back to the, uh, to the document. Julio Marín González, Mario Alberto Jiménez Castro, uh, known as Castor, Sergio Duarte Frias, are money launderers for the cartel who in addition to engaging in fentanyl trafficking are responsible for facilitating the movement of fentanyl proceeds from the United States to Mexico through, among other methods, bulk cash transport, wire transfer, trade of goods, and cryptocurrency. Important stuff. A lot of people asking if the cartels are using cryptocurrency. They're, for the most part, using cryptocurrency, but for international operations like importing fentanyl, uh, from China or laundering the proceeds of uh, these kind of operations. Ana Gabriela Rubio Sea, known as Gabi, is a Guatemala-based broker of fentanyl precursor chemicals who buys fentanyl precursor on behalf of the Chapitos and connects members of the cartel with suppliers in China who supply the particular chemicals required to manufacture the cartel's fentanyl at clandestine labs in Mexico controlled by the Chapitos. One of the very first times we hear from these Guatemala broker on some of my previous videos from early on, I shared information about how the Chinese CCP is operating in southern, in, in the southern Mexican border in Chiapas, but also in places like Guatemala where a man who was actually linked to Donald Trump and on one of those videos I actually shared a photo of this Chinese man who is uh, working directly for this Sinaloa cartel woman has at least a couple of photos with Donald Trump during his campaign. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically you know, a direct link between these powerful people and at the very center you have this Guatemalan uh, woman connecting cartels, and actually she offered the Chapitos to move their kitchens uh, very recently to Guatemala for all the hits they've been gotten um, on, their, on their kitchens. I'm um, gonna read some of the documents as well, guys. Uh, TRX uh, Media, where can I find this paperwork? Anyone, maybe Ground News can point you to the documents. Uh, they're public court documents, just ask chat GTP. Definitely, this is, this is public documents, nothing hidden. It was just recently unsealed. These documents were, for the most part, unsealed. I managed to talk to um, federal um, officers that shared not the document, work, but some of the information. Uh, probably starting a year ago, but now it's in sealed, it's public. Um, I'm gonna leave the documents. There's a lot of new indictments. There are like four or five different new indictments on seal um, that I'm gonna leave uh, you guys, uh, channel members, on my, on my uh, webpage. 
on my YouTube channel, excuse me. So yeah, let's go back into it. Let's go back into the Chinese part of it. Kung Yang Yong Hao Wu, known as Tim, Yakin Wu, known as Lily, and Wa Tao Yao, known as Yao, are Chinese suppliers of fentanyl precursors who work for companies in China that manufacture fentanyl precursors chemicals. They source fentanyl precursors chemicals from their companies, factories in China, and ship those chemicals to Mexico with knowledge that the chemicals will be used in cartel labs to manufacture fentanyl for the cartel. These guys are still operating. Their companies are still very much um, working open, and they're not only selling or trafficking precursors for Mexican drug cartels, they're also sending shit tons of precursors to the US. If you go and look into um, Joanna Segovia's case, this former leader of the police union in San Jose, California, she had been receiving precursors and already made fentanyl from one of these companies for at least seven years while being the head of the San Jose Police um, Union. Means and method. So there is a lot of new background, uh, I mean, a lot of old background, you know, in fentanyl, when they started reporting uh, the overdoses, 2019, 2021. But these, as we just learned from the interview on this week, um, it started hitting as far back as 2014, starting in the U.S. Um, the Sinaloa cartel also, you know, like the cartel was formed amongst others uh, by El Chapo, El Mayo, and El Azul. The three factions remain stable till they're gonna fight. So yeah, this is basically just giving us a lot of background of what happened and how the plazas were distributed after the Sinaloa cartel broke into several factions. Um, uh, the escape of El Chapo, El Culiacanazo, uh, who of the Chapitos basically stayed on top, and then all the Ninis working for the Chapitos. So a lot of background here. Let's go to the interesting stuff. Cartels, fentanyl trafficking operations. Here is some really interesting details. The protection of the cartel's fentanyl trafficking operation by violent sicarios and corruption. As set forth above, the Chapitos command a powerful security apparatus comprised of cartel sicarios who are currently led by Ivan Archivaldo, Jesus Alfredo, Oscar Noé Medina, under Medina Gonzalez, who is Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar, principal deputy, or the cartel sicarios loyal to the Chapitos, including the two leaders of the Ninis. El Nini, Néstor Isidro, and Jorge Humberto Figueroa Benítez, known as the 27, El 27. Pérez Salas and Figueroa Benítez perpetrate violence. Um, the cartel uses violence for a variety of reasons, all in furtherance of the overreaching goals, constantly increasing the cartel's power and ex exerting and maintaining control over fentanyl trafficking. Such acts of violence are the cartel to, among other things, promote and enhance the reputation and position of the cartel, protect and maintain the cartel power and control in territories in Mexico, discipline and punish members and associates of the cartel who fail to carry out their duties, intimidate local civilians, populations, and attack law enforcement and government officials in order to prevent interference with the cartel's fentanyl trafficking, protect the cartel's leadership, maintaining security for its fentanyl operation, these sicarios and associated groups are on large scale military grade weapons to protect the cartel's operations. These weapons serve as the primary tools for perpetrating violence in Mexico against other traffickers, civilians, and government officials and security forces. These weapons carried and used by the cartel sicarios and at times by other members of the cartel, including the chapitas themselves, include armored trucks, bazookas, rocket launchers, grenades, and handheld grenade launchers and various types of firearms ranging from a 47, 38 caliber handguns to AK-47s, AR-15s and other machine guns. A photograph showing an example of the firearms maintained by uh, and used by the cartel is below. This image, really interesting stuff. This image shows a big load of, uh, of weapons on a wooden box. What is a uh, 
interesting from this, that image I was just uh, showing you guys is basically that um, it shows that the Chapitos faction of the Sinaloa cartel were infiltrated. And for what I've lear recently learned over, these, uh, over this weekend, I learned that it was not a DEA or fe US federal agent infiltrating the Chapitos, but rather they paid shit tons of money to a snitch. So basically the Chapitos had a rat inside the cartel. Someone who has been receiving money for at least the last three years and who has access to go back and forth from the US to Mexico. We're gonna be reading some more details. Very fucking revealing about who this niche might be. I mean, I don't wanna point out to who that is, but how the DEA said they infiltrated the um, city local cartel, but rather spent a lot of money into one of the guys who was really close to the inner circle of the Sinaloa cartel. We're not talking about, you know, like a guy who's uh, do, just running errands. Talking about a guy who the Chapitos trust enough to give him uh, enough power to negotiate fentanyl products, fentanyl trafficking, uh, uh, money, all the kind of like decision making shit on the US side on behalf of them. And he was giving all this information, including photos, videos, audios to the feds. So yeah, let's let's keep going here, guys. In the campaign of violence currently being waged by the cartel and other traffickers for territory in Ciudad Juarez, Juan Pablo Lozano Camarón, the guy who I uh, told you before was a uh, huge operating in the uh, border of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, is a major producer of weapons for the cartel, its sicarios and cartel-aligned groups. He regularly crosses from the United States to Mexico with firearms, including machine guns, often with large firearms hitting or on his person. Some of the larger caliber machine guns and grenades smuggled and supplied by Pablo Lozano have been routed for the cartel use in Sinaloa, while some of the smaller caliber pistols smuggled and supplied by Pablo Lozano have been routed into the Ciudad Juarez jails for use by imprisoned cartel sicarios. These sicarios are, of course, the Mexicles, um, whose main leader was recently nabbed in Juarez, El Neto, after killing 10 prison guards during his escape. Mm -hmm. Very probably weapons trafficked by Pablo Lozano. The procurement of fentanyl precursor chemicals. The cartel relies primarily on chemical companies outside of Mexico for obtaining precursor chemicals that are necessary to make fentanyl. China has emerged as the source of the vast majority of these chemicals used by the cartel. Should we already know? The Chapitos and the Confederates are, uh, have used various means to purchase fentanyl precursors, chemicals from chemical and pharmaceutical companies in China. Things that we know, and they use brokers like Ana Gabriela Rubio Sea, this Guatemala-based broker who works with the cartel among other traffickers. Remember I told you that she also serves as a middleman, not only for the Sinaloa cartel, but also for the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación and others. Rubio Sea, uses her connections to China-based suppliers and chemical manufacturers to procure fentanyl precursor chemicals for the cartel and to put cartel traffickers in touch directly with those China-based suppliers, knowing that these chemicals will be used to manufacture fentanyl for ultimate distribution in the United States and elsewhere. Rubio Sea told Chinese precursor supplier, Yong Wang Hu, Tim, let's, call, let's fucking call him Tim, the defendant, in an encrypted message, we are the biggest, we are the biggest in Mexico, so we can purchase a lot of precursor chemicals. Gavi has also used her expertise and contacts to ensure that precursors reach their destination without being interdicted by custom officials in Mexico or elsewhere. For example, Rubio Sea has arranged for chemicals to be disguised in food containers or packaged along with legal chemicals to avoid detection. 
On other occasions, Rubio Sea has relied on corruption at the border to successfully get the product into the country. In China, according to the U.S. Department of State, ineffective oversight of the massive chemicals and pharmaceutical indus industries provides an ideal environment. Shit, we know. I mean, China and the China's um, Communist Party, of course, they say they're not doing anything wrong, that the fucking companies are actually legal and lawful and that they're not breaking any law and that they ha don't have any record of you know sending shipments of uh, precursors uh, most of these companies and we see the names right here which is important shit um wuhan shokan biological technology ltd or sk biotech it's based out of wuhan from where allegedly covid broke out um this company allegedly sells cleaning uh, precursors supplies, but of course it's a fentanyl producer. Also, there is another company quoted right here, but let's go into this. On or about February 9, 2023, for example, Yao inquired of a precursor chemical purchaser whether certain precursors being shipped to New York City were eventually going to be shipped to Mexico. When the purchaser confirmed, Yao noted that he more typically sells chemicals to Mexico through Germany. On or about February 14 this year, Jiaqin Wu explained in the course of communications to arrange fentanyl shipments that Mexican authorities are not able to detect that the chemicals come from China, stating that since we dare to sell this thing, it means that our resources and channels are no problem. Yonghan Wu, Yonghan Jiaqin Wu, and Yao also provide assistance to the cartel with, development, with developing what they have described as efficient preparation methods for fentanyl manufacturing, including by providing information about exactly what other chemicals are needed to mix with the precursor chemicals in order to produce finished fentanyl for distribution. On or about December 19 last year, for example, Yakin Wu described what she understood to be the most cost-effective starting material for manufacturing fentanyl, detailing how the particular chemical she offered could be used for fentanyl synthesis. Guys, this is something I've been telling guys for a while back. It's something that I was sold and that it, this is also in one of my several videos here in my channel. They are, I mean, the Mexican drug cartels didn't know what to do with the fentanyl or with the precursors. So this is a fucking, you know, like this was a plan since the beginning from China to offer these fucking drugs to Mexican drug cartels to put them on their hands, even though they didn't, didn't even know what, what to do with it. We just heard from the interview that just premiered earlier today from this street drug seller that they didn't even, they didn't even know that heroin w had fentanyl back in 2013, 2014. So someone was shipping this with the intention of fuck up a country and it's succeeding. And this shows because the Mexican cartels or chemicals or whatever are asking the Chinese, what do we do with this, this shit, right? Like, how do we actually manufacture or synthesize fentanyl? They don't know. The guy I interviewed for one of these videos that are posted on my channel, he told me directly that they sent, one of these companies sent this Chinese chemist to show them how to cook. And he uh, trained him for over a month. After a month, he asked him to do a batch on his own. And after getting a good batch, he was ready to go. These Chinese chemists never went back to China. Well, he didn't get back to China immediately. He went to Michoacan and Guerrero to train also um, chemists or cartel people of the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación. This is fucking intentional. This is no business model. These guys are not getting wealthy or millionaires in China because China has a state control of how much wealth can you have so this is an operation of a fucking government so th this is something that to me at least it's really important that we understand that we have that information available all right let's go let's go back to this document 
Like certain other companies in China involving the illicit supply of fentanyl precursors to drug traffickers, SK Biotech projects a purported air of legitimacy and takes steps to avoid detection and prosecution by law enforcement. On its website, for example, the company advertises itself as a manufacturer of legal raw materials. Those chemicals, however, are principally those, uh, those that are often used as cutting agents for illegal narcotics, including fentanyl. Moreover, while SK Biotech headquarters are based in Wuhan, China, the company has a factory based elsewhere in the country, allowing SK Biotech to manufacture illicit chemicals alongside legal raw materials. Again, all these uh, raw materials or precursors are not illegal in China. They are absolutely legal. China has not taken steps to stop these, uh, these companies from producing these particular chemicals, saying that they are absolutely legal uh, you know, chemicals to be produced. Now let's go with Lily. On March 10 this year, Lily told a buyer of fentanyl precursors, what you want is a drug, not a normal product, and the normal time for delivery is about seven days. This cargo is so special that the freight for water also needs to carefully disguise it. They know what they're selling. They know that they're not selling fucking legal precursors and what they're selling is drugs. Manufacturing of fentanyl. The cartel uses the precursor chemicals procured from China to manufacture fentanyl in laboratories in Mexico. In or about 2014, the Chapitos began manufacturing fentanyl in a single makeshift lab located within a modest house in Culiacán. Again, this kind of goes with the same thing that our source just said on the interview premiered earlier today, right? He told us that around the end of 2013, probably 2014, they started getting heroin that was super potent that he himself owed, well, almost did on it and then what it came out of the hospital was that it was laced with fentanyl so it was about the time when alleged uh, accordingly to these documents los chapitos began synthesizing and mixing fentanyl with other substances all right, let's get back to it, guys. Uh, all right. Okay, once processed, okay, so they, they cook at uh, these uh, small houses in Culiacán, then they are transported to Tijuana to be smuggled across the U.S.-Mexico border. Since those early days of the cartel's fentanyl trade, the cartel's manufacture of fentanyl has exploded, something that we already know. The growth has been fueled, at least in part, by the cartel driving users of other drugs to fentanyl by mixing fentanyl into other drugs to increase their potency. I think when we, when we talk about other drugs, it's for the most part heroin. Indeed, as the cartel's fentanyl trade grew, heroin traffickers for the cartel began to struggle to sell their product. As a result, Ovidio Guzman Lopez established an outpost in Mexico City where heroin traffickers can go to purchase fentanyl to mix in with their heroin. Cutting their product with fentanyl has allowed the cartel heroin traffickers to enter their customer base, but substantially increases the risk of overdose. So this is absolutely true. The cartel at the very beginning didn't know what to do with fucking fentanyl. They just mixed it with China White, started shipping it across the border, and when they try to you know, like their own sellers or buyers or brokers try to sell non-laced heroin, they came back to the cartel saying they don't want the shit. They want the potent shit with fentanyl. So they established a cook in Mexico City to show everyone how to basically mix. The cartel also now employs skilled chemists known as cooks who have the expertise to synthesize fentanyl by combining and manipulating multiple different precursors chemicals. Many of the cooks work in cartel-controlled clandestine fentanyl labs on ranches owned by high-level members of the cartel and in smaller houses in and around Culiacán. The cartel's lab are heavily guarded cartel assets protected by armed security. Now, these can be true, but can also not be true. Um, as you guys have seen from my reporting, most of the outdoors laboratories are absolutely guarded by armed people. 
But the indoors laboratories, basically places where they press pills, are not. I, I mean, most of the people are armed, but not heavily armed, and definitely not a lot of them. The day-to-day -day control over such lab varies across the cartel. The Chapitos directly control some of those labs, such as the labs in which Carlos Limon has worked and others are maintained by the Chapitos' closest security personnel, including El Nini and El 27. Other fentanyl traffickers who work for the cartel are uh, permitted by the Chapitos to run their own networks of labs, including Limon, Jesus Tirado Andrade, Carlos Omar Felix Gutierrez, and Silvano Francisco Mariano, known as Rayo. Out of these labs, whether overseen directly by the Chapitos, by cartel sicarios loyal to the Chapitos, or by cartel traffickers who operate in areas controlled by the Chapitos, source precursors from the Chapitos and employ the same shared groups of cooks who make the fentanyl. Unlike other dangerous narcotics that can take months and many acres of land to grow, fentanyl can be manufactured in small labs over the course of just a few days. <clears throat> in one day alone, a cartel cook can manufacture in excess of 100,000 pills using pill press machine, such as the pill press picture below. Esta, this was a pill press machine owned by L14. This one, uh, is, if I'm not mistaken, was seized at the Mexico City Airport, I think. At the cartel labs, fentanyl is manufactured in both powder and pill form. In either form, the fentanyl is sometimes mixed with other substances, some benign and some with other psychotropic effects before being important to the United States. The purity of the cartel's fentanyl varies greatly depending on the method and skill of the particular manufacturer. In spring 2022, Ovidio Guzman Lopez noted that he was working to centralize all fentanyl manufacturing in Sinaloa, effectively establishing a monopoly for the cartel over the fentanyl market in Mexico. As part of that effort, the cartel is trying to manufacture the most potent fentanyl and to sell it in the United States at the lowest price. Currently, for what I'm hearing, um, these um, pills cost, they have a, a cost of production of some 50 US cents, but they sell for up to five, six, seven US dollars. At a bulk price, they sell at least for one US dollar. So we're talking about um, growing business. We're talking about that the uh, Ovidio is trying to, was trying to lower the costs, meaning that probably more shitty quality stuff and trying to sell more in bulk. That's also important to the effect of what's happening in the U.S. Uh, with this shit. Let's get back to it. While the cartel possesses the technical capability to test and thus test fentanyl purity in, lab, in the lab setting, as I show you on one of my stories where this guy shows us how to slide a pill for, cart, for um, quality um, tryouts, Certain cartel traffickers have also resorted on occasion to cruder and more dangerous methods. El Nini and El 27, for example, have tested fentanyl on the individuals who were tied down and three cooks in a fentanyl lab that they controlled died after sampling the product. More recently, in or about 2022, El Nini and El 27 experimented on a woman whom they were supposed to shoot. Instead of shooting victim two, however, Nini and El 27 injected her repeatedly with a lower potency of fentanyl until she ultimately overdosed and died. Similarly, when an addict died testing cartel fentanyl produced by Carlos Limon, Limon sent the batch of fentanyl to the US States, the United States anyways. So guys, I don't know what you think, think about this stuff. If you either say it like they're testing your drugs so they can fucking have to, or just be more mindful of the shit you're getting in the US, right? I mean, many of us are absolutely terrified that there are products that are tested on animals. This is fucking product tested on human lives. Absolutely ruthless, violent, you know, this is this is fucking crazy, guys. And uh, 
even though some of them have died because of the quality of the, of the pills or of the fentanyl, they still ship it over to the U.S., it's still hitting the streets in Albuquerque, El Paso, L.A., Chicago, New York, all these different places. So, yeah, this is this is one. This was one of the most shocking uh, revealings from this from this document. The trafficking of fentanyl too and distribution within the United States. Um, basically, they're saying that these guys, after cooking fentanyl, they ship it over to the U.S. The methods through which cartel traffickers import fentanyl across the border into the U.S. are diverse. Most often course is through ports of entry something that again it's not what we're hearing in most of u.s outlets we're hearing that migrants are carrying loads of uh, fentanyl that are coming in between borders bullshit it's coming on ports of entry with the help of corrupt u.s federal agents as an example of how the cartel imports its fentanyl into the U.S., in or about August 20, 2021, in or around El Paso, Texas, a high-ranking member of a Chapitos aligned gang from Ciudad Juarez introduced a corrupt border official and cartel co-conspirator to Juan Pablo Lozano, known as Camarón, the defendant, one of the cartel's fentanyl and weapons smugglers, as described above. Over the ensuing approximately 12 months, Co-conspirator 2, in exchange for payment for the, from the cartel, facilitated Pablo Lozano trafficking by permitting Pablo Lozano to cross into and out of the United States as he desired during Co-conspirator 2 shift, which began each night at approximately 10 p.m. During Co-conspirator 2 shift, Pablo Lozano also smuggled fentanyl pills through the port of entry with mules. American woman recruited by Pablo Lozano will ingest or insert into their bodies up to approximately 20, uh, 2,000 packaged fentanyl pills on each of three trips across the border each night. Pablo Lozano also maintained a house just outside of El Paso where he would bring the fentanyl smuggled across the border during co-conspirator to shift. From the house, Pablo Lozano sold the Chapitos fentanyl in bulk to customers in among other cities, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and traded fentanyl for cars that could be resold in Mexico or used to smuggle more fentanyl across the border. Fucking mind blowing. So here's what we're hearing from that. It's not only the Mexicans involved in it. We're talking about US agents in the game. This is one of the first few times that an indictment an indictment accepts that there are border agents in the payroll of the chapitos and they're, 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 they're opening up the borders for these shit to come in and out. This has been happening for a good while. They are hiring women, as we learned, to traffic this shit on their bodies and to stash them in places like Socorro, Horizon, and all this stuff around El Paso before getting distributed into places like New Mexico. This is why I thought it was really important the interview that we just watched uh, premiered on my channel with this New Mexico based um, street drug seller. Because he breaks us exactly what is happening and how is this shit getting to these places. And now this indictment is saying again, this stuff is going mainly to New Mexico from the hands of Los Chapitos with the help of U.S. federal agents. The cartel also imports its fentanyl into the U.S. away from ports of entry by, among other means, boats, private planes, tunnels, and ATVs. For example, a roughly one mile long tunnel dug underneath the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona has been used by cartel traffickers, traffickers carrying fentanyl loads. Originating under a small office on the Mexican side of the border, this tunnel leads directly into a small office on the U.S. side of the border, allowing cartel traffickers to come and go freely from both locations as purported employees of either office without raising any suspicion. The tunnel is one of many secret tunnels that provide quick and covered passage for cartel traffickers who must crawl through these small tunnels on their knees while carrying fentanyl loads. Once the cartel fentanyl is crossed the United States, cartel traffickers maintain designated stash locations where the fentanyl is stored. 
and the cartel U.S. Bay Distribution Network then sells the fentanyl wholesaler for retail distribution throughout the United States, including in New York, in New York City and elsewhere. So again, they sell this shit on uh, bulk, right? They're not, they're not selling, the Mexican drug cartels are not selling on the streets. They seldom have presence in the U.S. as a cartel. They basically just cross drugs, stash in the U.S. and then wholesale everything to gang leaders in the U.S. Uh, most of these cartel stash locations are clustered in the U.S. metropolitan areas along the border in, for example, Southern California, El Paso, and Phoenix, from where the cartels fentanyl is redistributed across the nation, including to the Bronx, um, New York, and other destinations. In Los Angeles, for example, traffickers working Ovi with Ovidio Guzman Lopez, the Chapito, principal responsible for overseeing the cartel's fentanyl manufacturing and distribution business, maintain houses and storage units that have been used to store and then ship more than 80 kilograms of fentanyl. In or about 2018, traffickers working for Ovidio Guzman, along with Noel Lopez, El Tio, and Samuel Leon Alvarado, who were hiding the cartel's fentanyl in a hotel room, had to move approximately 20 kilograms of fentanyl out of the room after a housekeeper observed the narcotics. Fearing that they could be followed, the traffickers buried the fentanyl at their stash house in Los Angeles, Parma neighborhood. Slowly over time, these traffickers dug up the fentanyl and shipped it by U.S. commercial carriers to book customers in, among other places, Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Large quantities of the cartel's fentanyl are also smuggled from Mexico into and distributed out of Phoenix. Hundreds of kilograms of cartel fentanyl and hundreds of thousands of cartel fentanyl pills are regularly seized by law enforcement in and around Phoenix, La Finiquera. For example, in a single day, on or about August 19, 2022, approximately 41.2 kilograms of fentanyl powder and 60, 630,000 fentanyl pills, as well as approximately 22,000 in cash, were seized from a single stash house in Phoenix and displayed in the picture below. There you go. The fentanyl pills and kilograms of fentanyl belong to the cartel and including, included stamps with two of the Chapito signature symbols the words Chapisa and Raton, which are a common name for the Chapitos, which uh, was kind of like a, a dumb move, right? To fucking uh, brand your own stuff with your name. I mean, who really does that? I'm not, I'm not seeing any of these photos. I'm seeing Max. I'm seeing, I don't know what, what else here. I don't know what this is. I'm not seeing ningún Raton or ninguna Pisa or Chapisa. Fentanyl trafficking is extremely profitable for the cartel. Mm, the cartel can purchase approximately one kilogram of fentanyl precursor from China for approximately 800. I also have a video breaking down costs from China to the U.S. streets selling. Uh, if you want to watch that, go to my YouTube channel and you'll find uh, how prices rises from 800 to over a million U.S. dollars. So yeah, these guys are talking about um, the prices that we kind of know. The fentanyl can be sold wholesale in the United States for as low as 50 cents a pill, depending on the particular city or area in which it's uh, sold. All right. At times, the cartel wholesale fentanyl distribution business in the U.S. leads to the Chapitos and their confederates carrying out violence in the U.S. to protect and maintain their operations. For example, in or about July 2019, El Tio, and Samuel Leon Alvarado ordered co-conspirants uh, one to murder an individual who had purchased fentanyl from Ovidio Guzman Lopez but refused to pay for the drugs. Co-conspirants cons uh, well, CC1 did as directed and hired another individual, individual to shoot victim three. On or about July 23, 2019, victim three was shot by a survived. The laundering of fentanyl proceeds very interesting stuff here about um, the use of cryptocurrency. And the methods for these money laundering schemes are diverse. You know, of course, they use uh, offshore bank accounts, real estate, physical goods, and digital currencies. The value of funds being laundered to Mexico for the cartel is staggering. As noted above, over the course of approximately two years, for example, a single cartel trafficker in the U.S., assisted in the laundering of more than 24 millions in narcotics proceeds belonging to Ovidio, 
by providing to cartel money launderers in the U.S. approximately 15 million. And by sending approximately 9 million in bulk cash to Mexico, hidden in secret compartments in cars. Another cartel trafficker based in Phoenix, over the course of just approximately six months, in or about 2021 and 2022, delivered launderers stationed at a bar in Phoenix tens of thousands of dollars of narcotics proceeds on a weekly basis. Julio Marín González, Mario Alberto Jiménez Castro, Nonas Castor, and Sergio Duarte Frías are three of the money launderers who work for the cartel to launder its fentanyl proceeds enabling the cartel to read up the massive profits from its fentanyl sales. One such scheme operated with the support of Yuman Archivaldo is a trade-based money laundering operation run by Julio Marin Gonzalez. Marin Gonzalez, a Mexican citizen, owns multiple cell phone stores in Mexico, including in Culiacán, Sinaloa, and Mazatlán, which he uses in connection with his money laundering operation involving fentanyl proceeds that belong to the cartel. Specifically, Marin Gonzalez purchases U.S. dollars in bulk from Mexico-based cartel traffickers at discounts in exchange for Mexican pesos. Uh, in, in Mexico, we call them uh, Casa de Cambio. The U.S. dollars are proceeds that cartel traffickers generate from sales of fentanyl in the United States, including New York, Phoenix, San Diego, Los Angeles, Newark, and Philadelphia. After paying the cartel traffickers in Mexican pesos, Marin Gonzalez directs his U.S.-based career to retrieve the traffickers' drug proceeds at specific locations in the U.S., including in Phoenix and New York. Mar Marin Gonzalez, U.S.-based careers at Marin Gonzalez Direction, then use those drug proceeds to purchase cell phones in bulk in the United States. The cell phones are then smuggled into Mexico and delivered to Marin Gonzalez cell phone stores, where Marin Gonzalez sells the cell phones at an inflated price. The cartel also uses cryptocurrency-based money laundering operations to ensure that proceeds generated from the sales of its fentanyl in the United States are provided to the cartel in Mexico. For example, Mario Alberto Jimenez Castro, known as Castor, and Sergio Duarte Frias operate a U.S.-based money laundering organization that uses cryptocurrency to launder cartel drug money to Mexico from the U.S., including from New York City, Boston, Denver, Nashville, Omaha, and Salt Lake City. Since at least in or about August 2022, Jimenez Castro and Duarte Frias, who report directly to the deputy of Ivan Archivaldo, that the, um, have directed individuals to keep up money from various traffickers in the U.S., and to then deposit that cash into various cryptocurrency wallets controlled by Duarte Frias or, or other high-level members of the disease organization. That cryptocurrency is then converted into regular currency and is able to be withdrawn by Jimenez Castro, Duarte Frias, or other members of the money laundering organization, which currently can then be provided directly to the Chapitos and their confederates in Mexico. Alternatively, once the fentanyl proceeds are deposited into cryptocurrency wallets, that cryptocurrency can also be used directly to purchase additional fentanyl without the need to convert the cryptocurrency back into cash. Between in or about August 2022 and February 2023, U.S.-based couriers acting at the direction of Jimenez Castro and Duarte Frias retrieved more than 869,000 in narcotics proceeds, which was then laundered via cryptocurrency, approximately 120,000 of the drug proceeds that Jimenez Castro and Duarte Frias worked to launder seized by the DA in Boston, Massachusetts. It's a uh, picture below. S good fucking stacks of money. How we doing, compas? Um, I wanna, wanna take a moment to read uh, through your comments and, uh, and see what's, uh, what's happening. We're almost, uh, we're almost uh, over with the, with the document. It's a lot of him for good information. From this, uh, from this document we're, we're, we're reading. The whole cycle of uh, fentanyl selling, producing, money laundering, and all this shit, some very revealing details. Major players that haven't uh, been out there before, like these uh, Duarte Frias and all these other money launderers, these uh, arms traffickers and all that stuff, really interesting shit in those documents this is only one indictment out of like five or six that were just recently unsealed there is a lot of information out there i'm going to try to break down all those into new videos on on this channel um i'm gonna read some of uh some of your your comments uh guys and i, I really want to to listen to to what you have to to say and and stop a while from reading and then start a conversation with you guys Alan Cesario, junkies aren't the pickiest of folks. 
absolutely they have to guard poppy fields to make sure nobody makes a tea but now have had to lower the ethics ethics let's go to Carter Jalisco Los Zetas Alan Cesario and Guatemala and Cola Fields have popped up in Guatemala as well while again yes it's crazy man that is a, that's, a, that's a huge thing cartels Mexican drug cartels are experimenting to where else they can harvest coca plants they try to do so in Guerrero in Oaxaca in Chiapas and in Guatemala and apparently Guatemala is one of the places where they kind of succeeded uh, the most still small fucking um, uh, land I mean and, and bad quality coca for what I'm hearing but if they manage to harvest coca other than Colombia they're gonna leave the Colombians out of the game for good and this is gonna be a game changer for Mexican drug cartels and the drug trade Phil Luis thanks for your hard work and coverage I really appreciate it man I hope this helps a lot into you know getting the facts right and getting uh, ourselves to actually know who's trafficking how is people trafficking drugs why are they trafficking this kind of stuff if they're actually using migrants or not because we hear a lot of bullshit a lot a lot of like misinformation out there from people that doesn't really know people that uh, don't take the time to read through these documents to find official documents to find federal law enforcement sources DA agents um, Mexican law enforcement to go down to Sinaloa to embed with uh, with their cartel and watch their operations to get back into the US go to places like Española, New Mexico, Albuquerque to talk with uh, street drug dealers so you can actually have a broader perspective of what the fuck is going on but sadly enough there's a lot of news reporters that they just read through all their headlines and then put themselves out telling a lot of lies or they just get a call a tip from a u.s politician and say like hey this is what what is happening uh, recently i just learned this and that they don't bet the information they go out to spread a lot of lies and it's uh, hurting us because then we're not putting the right resources where they have to be put right let's go back into the uh, document for a bit then Act in furtherance of the cartel of fentanyl trafficking operation. Here are some uh, good details as well. Talking about how members of the Ninis located one of the, these officers talking about Mexican law, federal law enforcement based on information provided by Perez Salas and kidnapped him from his vehicle while he was exiting the airport in Culiacán. I know firsthand how the Culiacan airport is absolutely controlled by the Sinaloa cartel because every time I go there my sources hit me up right as I get across the doors guarded by the Mexican National Guard when I cross those doors uh, put my uh, my cell phone back in service uh, I always get a call and say like hey you're wearing this and that right so yes meet you outside so they if you land in Culiacan thinking that you cool, you know, get your way, whatever. No way, they fucking kidnap a Mexican federal law enforcement as he deployed in Culiacán. The Ninis brought victim to the Navolato Sinaloa branch of Ivan Archivaldo, where he was tortured until Ivan Archivaldo and Jesus Alfredo arrived the following day. Upon their arrival, Ivan Archivaldo and Jesus Alfredo interrogated the victim and ultimately shot him in the head. Members of the Ninis kidnapped the second official and similarly brought him to the Navolato ranch of Ivan Archivaldo, where he was interrogated in the presence of Ivan Archivaldo, Jesus Alfredo, and El Nini. For approximately two hours, members of the Nini's torture victim five by inserting a corkscrew, sorry about that, inserting a car screw into victim uh, five uh, muscles, ripping it out of his muscles and placing hot chilies in his open wounds and nose. Following this torture, Ivan Archibaldo shot victim five. The bodies of victim four and victim five were dumped at a near particular motel of Mexican Federal Highway 15 outside Nabolato. In or about May 20, uh, 2017, Ivan Archibaldo, Jesus Alfredo, Oscar Noé Medina Gonzalez, El Pano, and El Nini captured three members of the rival Los Zetas drug cartel in the mountains near the border of Sinaloa and Durango major developments here back then there was a lot of rumoring about the setters trying to enter sinaloa 
they actually were trying to do it, but they were, as we are learning right now, stuck. The members of the Ninis, Ivan Archivaldo and Jesus Alfredo, to tortured victim six, victim seven, and victim eight, including with electrocution in order to obtain information about Los Zetas' associations with other rival cartels. When the interrogations were complete and in the presence of Jesus Alfredo Guzman, Medina Gonzalez, and Perez Salas on or about May 27, 2017, Ivan Archivaldo shot victim six, victim seven, and victim eight, killing them. Between in or about 2017 and in or about 2021, Ovidio Guzman and El Tio, Samuel Leon Alvarado, worked with Co. Watsisi One, who was based in the United States, to maintain multiple premises in the Los Angeles metropolitan area for the storage and a wholesale distribution of the cartel fentanyl source from the Chapitos. In total, Ovidio Guzman, Perez Lopez, and Leon Alvarado sent approximately 80 kilograms of fentanyl to CC1 in the U.S for storage and distribution. CC1 sold some of the fentanyl locally in, the LA, in, a, in LA and using commercial parcel carriers, shipped fentanyl to, among other places, Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. As noted above, in or about July 20, 20, 2019, Perez Lopez and Leon Alvarado ordered CC1 to murder victim three, who had purchased fentanyl from Ovidio Guzman, but refused to pay. CC1 did as directed and hired another individual to shoot victim three. On or about July 20, uh, 3, 2019, victim 3 was shot but survived. On or about May 28, 2019, approximately 10 kilograms of fentanyl belonging to Ovidio were seized by the DEA from two storage units used by the Chapitos operation in California. When CC1 refused to pay a debt owed to the cartel, Ovidio Perez Lopez and Leon Alvarado had CC1's brother kidnapped, detaining him for approximately three months and on one occasion torturing him with waterboarding to ascertain the location of CC1, a photograph of the narcotics seized from the two storage units below. This is a lot of stuff that Chapitos were doing in the US with the help of people like El Tio, Samuel Leon Alvarado, and other um, co defendants posted in this indictment. For approximately six million of those funds, uh, CC1 coordinated with Leon Alvarado by using photos of serial numbers on specific US dollar bills associated with the bull cash movements as, as proof of ownership of the funds. This is a, a very well known way to move money and to ensure that you're dealing with the right people, right? You will have a dollar serial number as a unique serial number to confirm transactions. So this is interesting. In or about 2019, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman, Jesus Alfredo, Oscar Noé Medina Gonzalez, El Panu, and El Nini met in Mexico to discuss the procurement of fentanyl precursors from China for use in the cartel's fentanyl manufacturing. During the meeting, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman identified which traffickers will be primarily responsible for the importation of precursors, and Jesus Alfredo Guzman recommended particular airlines for that importation touting the Chapitos connection and the Mexican customs who will allow the entry of the chemicals upon arrival. Medina Gonzalez stated that he will disseminate the information about the planned operation to others in the organization. Here's another important thing. For what I know from sources, and for what I know from uh, these uh, documents, the Chapitos were infiltrated at around 2019, right around when this happened. So I'm thinking that this meeting was a setup to start paying one of the closest members to begin uh, giving out information to, to, to the DEA, to US federal law enforcement. Why I think that is because the, most of the, the um, most of the uh, drug seizures coming next on the indictment, uh, you know, like they described how they were packaged, trafficked, sold, and then recovered by the DA. And this is very common of what is uh, what is happening when they have a rat inside the, the place, right? They they wouldn't know. That the uh, that the drugs were seized, they would only know that they were sold, and they were eventually seized by the DA. But they wouldn't know because they are they were already paid. See, this is what I was talking with Oscar Hagelsap on that previous interview a couple of weeks ago. 
um, he used to work with HSI and he was describing how these uh, undercover op operation goes. So they basically they do is they sent a people who is a known trafficker close to the cartel. He will work on behalf of the leadership of the cartel. He will sell, buy, whatever, get the money and get the money back to Mexico. But then the drugs are seized eventually from that other boy buyer. Uh, the thing is, drugs are being stopped and taken out of the streets. But money is still going to Mexican drug cartels during all these undercover operations, which is fucking mind-blowing because it means that it, this, this is even bigger than ATF Fast and Furious operations of uh, arms trafficking to Mexico. There is a lot of money millions of US dollars going back to Mexican drug cartels to, to use on their own benefit to make them more powerful. Uh, that, uh, that is money coming from an undercover operation, right? It's an undercover operation when one of these guys says, hey, I have the right buyer, uh, give me two fucking tons of fentanyl or cocaine or heroin, whatever. They will traffic that shit, they will sell that stuff, get the money to the cartel, and then seize the drugs, but the money is already in Mexico. So at the end, are they really hurting the Mexican drug cartels or are they only taking drugs out of the streets, which eventually are, they, they still have enough money to make another 10 new uh, you know, trafficking operations like that? that? Doesn't really make sense to me, guys. I mean, uh, this, is, this, is, this is wild, but yeah, I think, I think the Chapitos had someone talking from within right or about to 2019. Someone who presented himself as a major trafficker. I've heard this before from the Sinaloa cartel. They were looking for someone that allegedly was giving out information, but I guess they never thought that it was someone really high up on the, in the structure of Los Chapitos. They probably thought it was like one of the mid-range level commanders or something, but it was something, someone really high up there who was selling, well, selling information because he was getting shit tons of money for this. Um, and he was managing and overseeing these trafficking operations himself. himself. He was actually trafficking himself shit tons of drugs from the Chapitos to a US buyer. And after he sold the drugs, gave the money back to Los Chapitos, the drugs was, was uh, seized, but Los Chapitos already had made a huge buck out of these operations. Um, and this is, what I'm, uh, this is what I'm telling you guys. Um, they're talking about the Culiacanazo here, which is uh, basically what I, what I was telling you about um, here. In or about June 2020, CC1 sold approximately 2 kilograms of fentanyl and other narcotics in Los Angeles that he had received from Ovidio and Noel Perez, known as El Tio, Samuel Leon Alvarado, to a particular customer base in the New York City area. This customer drove the fentanyl and other narcotics across the country to Suffolk County, New York, transiting through New York City. On or about June 29, 2020, law enforcement arrested the customer and seized the two kilograms of fentanyl and other narcotics. This was something that was not happening, allegedly to the, I mean, according to this indictment, in 2017, 2018, it started happening in 2020, in 2019. They started arresting the customers and seizing the drugs, but the money was already back with Los Chapitos. So I think someone dealing with Ovidio, Noel, El Tio, and Samuel Leon Alvarado was the one selling information to the DA. On or about August 2022-2020, the DA seized approximately 53 kilograms of fentanyl precursors from three packages abroad aboard a cargo airplane that had arrived in Anchorage, Alaska from Hong Kong. The precursors belonged to Jesus Alfredo Guzman. So Jesus Alfredo was using Alaska as a hub to receive precursors. 
El Pano and were destined for Mexico City, where they were to be transported to Sinaloa to be manufactured into finished fentanyl before being trafficked to Tijuana and then to the United States. Again, Gavi from Guatemala purchased approximately 25 kilograms of fentanyl precursor chemicals from Kuni Jiang and his company in China, Sechuo Xiaoli Pharmatech, another Chinese company still operating, still open. The chemicals were flown from China to Mexico and arrived in Guadalajara on or about September 2, 2021. The, fifth, the 25th kilogram load was seized by Mexican enforcement official at the Guadalajara airport, as pictured below. This is one of the precursors batched, seized by Mexican authorities. And then you will have, like, you know, uh, the details about, like, other fentanyl operations, 20,000 pills sold for basically 20,000 US dollars. So it's basically $1 a pill. 50,000 fentanyl pills sold for approximately 50,000 US dollars. So back, the, back into to, uh, 2022, the price for, uh, uh, the bulk price for fentanyl pills were about $1 each. Um, and, and again, after this date, they started getting a lot of seizures. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, busts on their operations and I think that's that's when they when they had someone selling information to the DA guys I mean the document is for the most part um, over it's a uh, very redundant what what follows it follows well probably this is important let me show you these guys they um, Examples of those heavily armed guards are pictured below. They said that there was a meeting in Sinaloa by members of the Sinaloa cartel where they were discussing new loads and new methods to traffic fentanyl. And that meeting was guarded by heavily armed guards like these guys. Heavy machinery right there, guys. No fucking joke. Very young people, as I told you before, as the people... I told you when I managed to embed with the first inner circle of El Mayo Zambada in Sinaloa, people look like this. No fucking bulky former uh, special forces. It's kids like this who are guarding high ranking members of the Sinaloa cartel. You will, and, and again, these are uh, screen grabs from video taking by that one person selling information to the DA. You will also have a couple of other photos of fentanyl um, powder seized by the DA with Chinese markings on it, the bricks of pure fentanyl, and also, also you'll have um, no, I think that's basically that's basically uh, most of the most of the details. So all these are the accounts where um, that these twenty eight co defendants are facing, and then you'll have some uh, also some nasty details about how El Nini was feeding his tigers uh, with uh, enemies, alive enemies, um, at one of his ranches. Crazy fucking shit, guys. This document is really alignment. And this is the, that's just only one of a lot of documents. Um, what do you think, guys? I mean, I think this is really interesting to do. Um, we're, we're over almost 100 minutes now on, these, uh, on this live stream. Uh, I'm gonna go and enjoy more another Dos X guys. Uh, I don't know what you guys think about, about these uh, these are live streams where we, we can disseminate and comment and read through uh, official documents that are public, but for the most part are not reaching raw or in its raw form out there. Um, is, is it something that I should be doing more often probably uh, as more documents are uh, unsealed? Also, there is a lot of core documents from the Juarez Cartel, from Los Zetas, that are really interesting and, and enlightening. Not probably not from current events like this one, but still. Let me know, guys, if you what what, what do you guys uh, think about it. Alan, I know Phil, Luis. Do you know if Los Rusos, El Ruso, or Mayitos were named in the indictments? 
uh, with Los Chapitos and Sinaloa Cartels as a whole. No, man, another another interesting thing. No Mayos were named on on these indictments. Very fucking interesting that they were not named. They, they're, I mean, they're all they're named on a on a different indictment of the indictment uh, against uh, El Mayo and against El Russo and all those guys. But those are still sealed. They're probably because they're working, right? They're collaborating. They're they're getting a lot of information from from Los Mayos, as we learn also from Steve Rawls, that attorney in Tucson, um, that I recently interviewed, and you can see that interview as well. Uh, here in my in my channel, Phil Luis, please do. You're an excellent report and analyst. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate that. So yeah, I think it, it could be cool to have more of these uh, live, um, you know, like going through these documents and findings and photos and all these court documents that are um, kind of like yeah, they're easy to reach. They're out in the open, but you need to know what you're looking for, right? And you need to have a certain account and other shit, which I have. Um, so guys. I'll, I'll definitely um, take uh, your word for it and, and keep doing uh, more of these uh, live streams while going through indictments. Probably next week, let's go through the uh, indictment, the specific indictment against El Nini. Very interesting details as well there. And let me know if I show, uh, go also look into the Juarez Cartel indictments. Really cool stuff there. Well, really bad stuff there. About like, I don't know if you remember guys when they killed these two Americans in Juarez that were working at the US consulate in Ciudad Juarez and there's a lot of details of how they were working there there are transcriptions of the calls from the sicarios when they were about to do that hit ruthless violent shit man like crazy stuff really sad shit so yeah man I, I'll take your word for it please um, comment on these live or let me uh, message on the on the community tab to hear you out about what organizations, people, incidents should I be looking more into and opening these court documents and reading through on, on the next slide. Uh, this, I enjoy doing this. I think this, uh, this was really cool to, to do, to go through the document with you guys. Um, sorry for the fucking mess with my son at the beginning. I'm still trying to find out the details on how to, you know, share screen and all that shit. Um, and also, guys, uh, please don't forget to subscribe. I'm seeing that only 32% of the people watching my channel are subscribed. That means that I could get a shit ton of more subscribers if you don't forget to hit the subscribe button and tell your friends to subscribe to this channel to keep doing these live streams, uh, these premieres going out there. I want to go to the East Coast to do a lot of new interviews with people that are gonna bring out some really cool details. Um, also guys, uh, there is these, uh, these dollar sign right below the live chat where you can support my channel, even if it's one buck, um, whatever you can uh, donate so I can feel that I'm getting something out of YouTube because of course because of the of the you know the nature of the information I'm putting out there YouTube is not monetizing my videos and um, still I love to do this shit but I would love to you know like get some more funds to get probably someone to help me out with the fucking sound stuff <laughs> and also to get funds to travel more to other places to bring you exclusive interviews those, these are interviews I'm not publishing at the media I work with only because I really want to bring this information down to you until this channel becomes bigger. I have a broader uh, audience and probably be making more money out of it. But for now, I'm doing it for the sake of raw information going out to you guys. So I really appreciate you guys showing up, you guys liking. Please fucking subscribe. I'm seeing that 70% of you guys are not subscribed. That will be major fucking help. It doesn't cost a thing. Just hit subscribe and uh, that will be really, really uh, helpful. Alan Cesario, gracias, Luis. Te aprecio, man. I really appreciate that, man. Many thanks. Phil, I love your content here and advice. I would love to hear about everything when you have time. For Of course, man. Let's uh, let's try to do more more of these uh, live streams so I can t tell a lot of like personal stories. 
Uh, Danny Gomez, gracias for the content. Gracias, compadre. Thanks for being here, for showing up. Super amigo, does anyone have the indictment number or link to download this document? Super amigo, I'm going to be posting these documents, all of these indictments. I'm going to be posting them on uh, my um, uh, channel members uh, community tab. It only costs like four or five bucks to be a member of the channel, and you can see a lot of uh, a lot of um, raw footage from my deployments, a lot of documents, photos. A lot of interviews raw that are not included in my reportings uh, and all that stuff. So yes, um, Jay Gomez, Luis Alechid, and has a legit passion for his work. I absolutely do, man. I really appreciate your comment. Alan Cesario don't want to say he's not worth mentioning. Luis has more legit info. Many thanks, brother. Mike John Henry, please come out w with uh, t-shirts or hats, dude. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be bringing some fucking merch about. Uh, news about narcos um, is it something that probably you can um, you can um, you will you will get something like news about narcos is that cool or should I just put Luis Chaparro I don't know man I think it's gonna be weird to use something like with the name with my name on it right probably news about narcos is a cool branding I'll definitely uh, give a give it a thought man um, OHMS cheers cheers brother thanks again for the support Alan Cesario, Luis, can you tap into organ trafficking one day, please? Oh, of course, man. I'm getting gathering information of a network operating out of Cancun, nonetheless. You know, fucking Cancun, tourist destination in Mexico. Huge mafia. Alan Cesario, please. Uh, no, it's not your jam, but no one talks about it. Definitely, man. Yes, um, as I try to gather more information, I'm definitely going to hear that. Love the content. Thanks, Luis. Uh, thank you, Blown Goat. I really appreciate it, man. Um, and yeah, we're hitting over the 100 minutes here. I think this was, uh, this was really fun. Alan Cesario, Templarios, we're deep into the organ game. I'm sure you know a thing or two. I think there's, a, there's a, another mafia, probably broader, newer, more recent, and trafficking organs out of Cancun. Crazy shit. Iran Contra, uh, Luis on the big screen with Hulu making moves. Yes, guys, go watch. Uh, these uh, new National Geographic documentary called Narco States, uh, where I have a feature uh, with, with some of my, my friends, producers and directors of these uh, documentary. Those guys have done amazing work, is uh, now out on Hulu. So go watch it, tell me what you guys think about it. And um, let's, uh, let's keep each other in, in contact. And um, I promise I'm gonna bring you some crazy fucking shit for next week. Hopefully as usual, guys. It was uh, it was very cool to uh, to be here with you guys reading these indictments. Stay safe and remember to also subscribe to this channel to read all these indictments. It's open information, anyways. You can get all these indictments if you know where to look. The uh, U.S. Department of Justice uh, website, and you just need to know how to. If you're lazy about it, just subscribe to my channel. You're gonna get uh, exclusive lives, uh, exclusive footage photos, documents, all that shit. So it's not only these documents.